So chapter 10 of Tripura Rahasya, we stopped the last time at verse 15 and we will continue just to recap shortly when we left off the last time the prince Hemachuda and the princess Himalekha are in conversation and the gist of the conversation is that Himachuda has experienced the deepest bliss of pure consciousness and has lost interest in all worldly matters. Himalekha, on the other hand, is talking to him and trying to understand what has happened. He has a certain experience and due to this deep experience, meditative experience, he has lost interest in the world, does not want to return to it. If you recall the very last time I asked you, what is that state called? And many of you responded, some said it's a state of witness, the others said it's like death, some said it's a highly advanced state, samadhi. So different words, but yes, it was going in the same direction, all of them. And what happens is when you do not want to return from that state of your consciousness is that you are no longer able to maintain contact with the body. So if you stay in that very deep state of meditation where you are established with pure consciousness, if you have no interest anymore in worldly matters, you will not return from there. Which means you either attain the state of being Jivan Mukt and if you still have samskaras to live out, you live them out, but without falling into those glaciers. You remain untouched by these. And if you do not really have any karma to live out, then you would leave the body. So this is a very deep state of meditation, but he has still come back and he has lost interest in worldly matters. What can happen also is that this, this becomes also sort of escapism. People lose interest in the world, but this is not the higher path. In the higher path, we learn to live in the world and above it. So the state of witness would be somebody who can be established in the Atman, in pure consciousness, yet continues to live in the world. Why would anybody want to do that? Why would one want to remain established in pure Atman and still live in the world? This is a question to everybody. Would you like to stay in this world, continue to act in this world, if you were established in pure consciousness, if you'd be a witness, and you actually have nothing really more to live out as such, would you choose to stay in the body? Perry, to teach and help the others. Yes, that's wonderful. Anybody else would like to share? What would you do? You can also uh, unmute and speak <laughs> if you like. Matthias says the last of the karma is to live out the last of the karma. Is that what you mean? I'm not too sure what that means. Yes. Yes, to live out last of the karma as a Jeevan Mukt. Yes. Yes, it is said of masters, 
and great teachers that many choose to return to the world or stay in the world in order to help others out of compassion. Because once they are really done and the last of the karma has been lived out, they will not return to this world. They would leave. It does not mean necessarily absolute kevalya. It can happen that they have something to work out at another level. For that we can go to our diagram and have a look at that. In the diagram that we have, we can see here that if you are established in the center of consciousness here, but you still have something left in the active or latent state, while here everything has been already worked out, at the conscious mind level, the body level, it's all been worked out, so there's really nothing really left to be done, worked out, then that's, that's fine. But if it has not been worked out at the level of active unconscious mind and latent unconscious mind, then there is a possibility that one lives that out at the subtler level. And that's at the microcosm level. This is what you call heaven or hell and... So, at these deeper levels, you would still work out uh, these things and these samskaras. And if it's only at the latent level, that's the causal plane, then that's even a more advanced level. And such beings are called siddhas. They need to work out their karma only at the causal level. And... If you need to work out karma at the active unconscious state, that's called a jivan moksh. So these are the different levels. If you have none of this to live out, neither at the active unconscious state nor at the latent unconscious state, then you are an enlightened being, jnani, uh, having attained kevalya. So such a person is also called a arhat. And Arhat may also choose to return, even though he has no karma to work out at conscious or unconscious level. And he may choose to come back to any of these levels and help those who are working out the last of their karmas. So for example, such a master, an Arhat, who is completely free, could choose to go to the level of the latent unconscious mind and help other siddhas who are working out the last of their latent unconscious samskaras. Any questions about this before we continue? So we stopped at verse 15 when that wise lady answered with a smile, My lord, you do not seem to have attained that pure state, the state of knowledge in which a realized soul never again becomes deluded, is far beyond your comprehension, exactly as the earth is far from the sky. Do you think you understand correct? What you think you understand correctly is like no understanding at all. That self illuminated state of being cannot be seen either by opening or closing the eyes. 
It cannot be attained by action or inaction, by renouncing home or living at home. If it is attained by closing your eyes, doing something or going somewhere, then how can it be supreme? That is poor knowledge, the awareness of which disappears when you open your eyes. How heavy is your delusion? What can I say about your amazing belief that knowledge of the absolute reality in which millions of galaxies rest in a small corner disappears when you open your eyelids? O oh, Prince, I will elaborate further. Unless the knots of ignorance are cut asunder, bliss cannot be realized. Failing to recognize the self is the cause of illusion. There are innumerable knots of ignorance. Seeing something different from the self is the first knot of ignorance. Those who identify their bodies with the self are ignorant. They go through the constant flux of misery and the cycles of births and deaths. The second knot is seeing a distinction between the self and the world. The world is like a mirror on which reflections are made. Seeing a difference between individuals and God is another knot. This ignorance regarding the self existed from the very beginning. It became tangled many times and has become a very complicated knot. It is with this knot that individuals are bound. Cutting this knot asunder is called liberation. That perfection you attained after closing your eyes is an aspect of your own self, which remains after denying the existence of all material objects. This is the infinite mirror in which the entire phenomenal world is reflected. Tell me in which objects grow so subtle that self does not exist. As a barren woman cannot have a son, similarly the real self and never be absent in any object. Without a mirror where there cannot be a reflection, without the light of Atman, all this would be unreal. Therefore, without self-existent reality, Nothing can exist. In such a state, it does not make any difference whether you open or close your eyes. If one believes that there is a particular method for attaining the self, that belief itself is a knot. As long as the feeling that I know reality through a particular method remains, you have not attained reality. Because anything that can be achieved through any method, is not the absolute. What you believe you have attained by closing your eyes cannot be the ultimate because its perfection is marred by the process itself. Supreme knowledge is like an omnipotent, omniscient fire that consumes all illusions. All mental impurities are burned by the fire of knowledge. After realizing that state, nothing more remains to be attained. After cutting this knot asunder, one has perfect mastery over the mind and its modifications. See the blissful, all-pervading Atman. See the entire reflection of the universe in the mirror of the Atman within you. Do not ever contemplate that all this is Atman. Rather, transcend and become established in the experience of Atman itself. Hearing his wife, Hemachuda's mind became completely purified. After seeing the perfect self everywhere, all his confusion vanished. So that's another beautiful part here of this text, which explains that pure consciousness is not merely limited to the Atman, but in fact everything is pure consciousness. 
So going to our diagram here, we see that Himachuda had a little glimpse here of the center of consciousness. This means that he went in into deep meditation, had a glimpse, and then he came out here again to the level of the body. And this happens typically when one starts meditation, you begin to think that this there is a separation here, and, and indeed that is the very first step. So to say, I say first step, for most people this sounds like very advanced, but in reality this is the first step. When you begin to realize that there is a separation between something called consciousness and that which is not consciousness. That the body and the mind are somehow separate from that center of consciousness. And that you are not the body, you are not the mind. But this is the very first level. And it's only when you begin to realize that, in fact, everything is ultimately consciousness. And so you say, then you begin to see not just pure consciousness in the center, because after all, pure consciousness is like the blackboard on which you write, but it is also the writing, it's everything. So, even latent consciousness is made of that stuff, that stuff is pure consciousness. This is the building blocks. The active unconscious mind is also made of the same stuff, which is pure consciousness. Conscious mind is made of the same stuff. It's also consciousness. Your body is also made of the same stuff, which is, again, consciousness. The world, all the objects in the world, everything is made of consciousness. Everything around us is consciousness. It's the basic building block. This is the metaphysics. In physics, the, the natural science, we say that the building blocks of the universe are atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, all these are their building blocks. But for us, we say yes, that may be true when you study it from a physical perspective, but from the perspective of metaphysics, from this perspective of consciousness, we say everything is conscious. Everything has consciousness. Only the quality of consciousness differs. So, in some, the consciousness is very sattvic, in others, it is rajasic, in some, it is tamasic. We see this differentiation also in people, but we also see it amongst animals, amongst plants, even inanimate objects at some level have some sort of consciousness. It's very, very tamasic. It's gross, but it is still consciousness. So with that approach, if you, if you see the world, everything is Brahm, Brahman. Everything is Brahm means you start walking in Brahm. Everything around you is Brahman. Such a person is called a Brahmachari. Because everywhere he walks, he sees Brahman. Everything around him is Brahman. And this is all consciousness. Any thoughts about this? Any comments? So Hema Lekha says, see Atman everywhere, 
Don't just see Atman there deep inside you, you, therefore you have to close your eyes, you have to meditate. But now that you've had that experience, you need to go to the next level. And this level is seeing consciousness everywhere. You don't need to con contemplate this is Atman, but rather be established in Atman. And when you are established in Atman, you will see consciousness everywhere. This is another important aspect here. Is that this is talking about Advaita. Advaita is non-dualism that basically everything is divine, everything is godly or consciousness. For those who accept this at a theoretical level, they will contemplate on this and say, all this is Atman. And this is exactly what the text says you should not do. Instead, meditate. Yes, do meditate. Go to that state where Hemachuda was and then attain it. Be established in the Atman and then you will see that all this is Atman. I have mentioned this story earlier. Some of you may recall that in India, I met people, students of a, a group, where the essential practice was to walk around during their daily life and keep repeating, all this is Atman, he is Atman, she is Atman, everyone's Atman, all this is Atman. This is exactly what they were doing. They were repeating this almost like a mantra. And the Purarasya explains, this is what you should not be doing. Because it is something like an affirmation. You can keep repeating to yourself. It's like a hypnosis, but it doesn't really work because it remains at the very superficial level of the conscious mind. So I will continue with verse 39. Hearing his wife, Hemachuda's mind became completely purified. After seeing the perfect self everywhere, all his confusion vanished. Step by step, with his firm faith, he attained maturity in his realization, became firm in that consummate state. After that, he lived for several years as a Jeevan moth, liberated here and now while enjoying worldly pleasures, conquering enemies, amassing wealth, and performing elaborate religious ceremonies and rituals. I will stop here to comment on this. It's a very interesting paragraph. We can see that Hema Chuda, as we know, had a deep meditative experience and attained that state of, no, of, of the Atman. But you can see from this paragraph, it says, step by step he attained maturity in his realization. It's a very important comment, a very important line, because it indicates that having a one-time experience, insight or glimpse is not enough. It is really good and helpful because it gives you a direct experience and there are no more doubts. Whatever practice you do is henceforth not based on belief but is based on direct experience. And so that's important to have that first glimpse. But it is not sufficient. You have to continue step by step. So you can say that that first glimpse of pure consciousness is only the beginning. It's only from that point of time that real practice begins. Because before that, everything you did was based on some belief. You believed your teacher, you believed the scriptures, you believed some other person of authority. 
but you had not your own direct experience. But from this point onwards, it's direct experience, so it's a completely different approach. And step by step, a systematic approach helps to attain maturity and become firmly established. There is no point if you do not do this step by step because you will lose you will lose um, you will lose track of the, the whole um, the energy which is released and the the development that you go through requires a certain systematic process so you need that and you need the maturity and finally to be established firmly otherwise you can fall you can fall off the path, you can lose those deep insights, they will be washed away again. So it's a great privilege when you have that insight to make the most of it, to take advantage of it and work harder with greater determination. And then you become a Jeevan Mok, as I Machuda did liberated here and now and now comes the line which says he did this liberated here and now while enjoying pleasures worldly pleasures conquering enemies and amassing wealth and performing religious duties which doesn't have to be religious in the sense of what we understand by religion but duties related to the rituals or the daily aspects of life. In the early days, these religious ceremonies and rituals were really part of life. Today, they are not so much a part of our lives. In most modern societies, most modern persons, uh, most of us do not actively practice these things anymore. But we do have certain rituals which we go through in our daily life. Not religious rituals, but the way we live. And we have our duties to our family, etc. So you can continue to do all these and still be a Jeevan Mukt. Any questions, any thoughts about this? Hmm. Firm is very profound. What causes us not to be firm? Well, that's the nature of the mind. Because you're, when you're not established in pure consciousness, you will be lost because there are so many impressions, so many things coming at you all the time. The senses have not been trained. So you go off track. You just go with any, anything which comes in front of you and you respond or, you, or rather you react to anything that comes forward. So be firm is very important if you do not want to go through that cycle of life and death again and again. If you are if you, you're not firm in the practice and you're not firmly established, it can get washed away and you when you fall, then it's very possible that you acquire even more karma, more samskaras, and even that what you have attained may be lost. It is rare, but it is possible that one who has acquired greater insights can fall and can be lost. So there are mythological stories that indicate that. For example, there is this story of a king who became a Jivan Mokt and uh, was living out or working out his karma at the state of the active unconscious level. But um, he acquired some very negative karma there 
and was had to return to the mortal state, the physical state, in order to work that out. So to answer Surabhi's question, Jivan Mukta is born again. Generally not, but there may be exceptions. But that is, as I indicated from this story, that these mythological stories were always symbolic in nature. And so those who have the wisdom and understand these stories, they understand the meaning behind them. And the deeper meaning is that it is generally not the case. But there may be exceptions. And that is called evil karma. When you perform an act of exceptional evil, then that karma accrues to you immediately. And that's been classified in the Yoga Sutras. Some of you may recall this. Actions, evil action against somebody who is very innocent, um, aged, the sick, somebody who comes to you for help, for shelter, and when you perform an act of great evil against such people, persons or beings in such category, that's considered a great evil, and that karma would accrue to you immediately. So that would be possible only in such exceptional circumstances. So Shibu says, if you become a Jivan Mok, what is remaining there for rebirth? As I just explained, Shibu, generally that does not happen. You don't, you're not reborn. You may have to work out something only at the level of the active or latent unconscious mind. So you do not have to come and take a body. But under exceptional circumstances, having performed evil acts, these acts of evil can also take place at the level of the unconscious mind. If that happens, then you may have to take birth again. But that is rare. Becoming a Jeevan Mukt itself is <laughs> rare and a very auspicious. One says that when someone becomes a Jeevan Mukt, all the Siddhas and other Jeevan Mukt celebrate. It's a very auspicious moment. Very auspicious. Very wonderful moment. So, it's a, it's a very beautiful thing. I continue to read from verse 43. Seeing this state, both his father, Mukta Chuta, and his uncle, Mina Chuta, wondered, why is Hema Chuta not as before? He is neither accelerated by pleasures nor affected by pain. How did he establish himself in the self? By attaining tranquility. These days he takes care of the entire administration like an actor on a stage. He is overwhelmed with bliss all the time. He performs his duties conscientiously, yet it seems as though his mind is firmly established in the self. How did this happen? Curious, they approached Hemachuda one day and asked, How did you attain this state of self and illumination? This little story here indicates how an external person would see this. A Jivan Mukt actually appears to an external observer as a very normal person. You don't necessarily notice that somebody is a Jivan Mukt. You may just see somehow a certain tranquility in this person that whatever comes, whatever happens, he is somehow balanced. And such a witness or such a person may also get angry or, or show anger or show sadness, show compassion. But the witnessing part in him continues to witness, remains unaffected. 
So in fact, externally one may or may not really recognize such a being, such a master. So verse 48, they approached Hemachuda and Hemachuda explained the whole story. Hearing that, his father and uncle also became enlightened. After that, the king's ministers also were liberated. In this way, everyone in that great city, even the children and cowherds, learned the method of attaining bliss. Men and women, young and old, after learning about pure consciousness and the universe, transcended their egos and body awareness. By having control over their emotions, they performed their worldly duties. Mothers fed their children while discussing the absolute reality. Servants would talk about truth as they worked, and actors performed dramas with spiritual themes. Musicians composed songs of spiritual wisdom, and comedians entertained their audiences, making them aware through comedy that the world in which they live is false. Teachers presented scriptures full of spiritual examples in order to strengthen the zeal of their students. In that great city, men, women, servants, actors, clowns, soldiers, laborers, architects and courtesans all realized the ultimate goal. Although they continued their occupations as determined by their previous samskaras, they never considered their given duties to be good or bad, auspicious or unauspicious. They bothered themselves neither about the past nor the future, and thus remained cheerful by living in the present, overwhelmed with bliss by discharging their duties. So this is very high yoga here, described in this paragraph. They continue their occupations. They did not consider their duties to be good nor bad, auspicious or inauspicious. They did think about the past or future. They were just living in the present. What is this path of yoga called? True Karma Yoga. Yes, that's right, Vishal. True Karma Yoga. Now, I think many of you are aware that a lot of people think that Karma Yoga is about doing voluntary service, you know, picking up leaves, cleaning the toilet in the ashrams, and... Um, doing charity work and so a lot of people talk about karma yoga in this manner and they think that it's the first step karma yoga but in reality when you understand the deeper aspect of spiritual life then you realize that in fact karma yoga is not really the first path that one takes but indeed it's it's the last stage, almost. When one has been really established in the self, then everything becomes yoga. Everything, all karma, all action you take is yoga. Continue reading from verse 62. The seer Shankar and other rishis once came to that city and named it Vidyanagar, a city of wisdom. Parrots and cockatoos in their cages sang the song of eternal wisdom. Contemplate the self as pure consciousness beyond both subject and object. Like reflections in a mirror, this external world is not different from consciousness. I am consciousness. 
Consciousness is immovable, yet it makes other objects move. O oh, people of the world, cut your ignorance by fixing your awareness one-pointedly on ever-illuminated consciousness. Meditate on that which is the source of all. This illus to a city where even the birds spoke wisely still exists today. Thus in ancient times, King Hemachuda received knowledge from Himalekha and lived as a knower of truth and a liberated being. Through him, all the men and women and children of that region realized the absolute truth. So what an amazing place this is. Even parrots and the cockatoos were speaking of pure consciousness and said, I am pure consciousness. Consciousness is immovable. Yet it makes objects move. So fix your awareness one pointed on ever illuminated consciousness. So what wonderful parrots these are. <laughs> you can see that when we talk about this high state of consciousness and begin to see everything as pure consciousness, one also says of such person that they're walking in Brahman, Brahmacharya, walking in Brahman, Everything is like a conversation. You're, you're having conversations or dialogues with everything around you. The whole world, the universe, becomes connected, living. And you have a dialogue or kind of a relationship with everything around you. And so it is not inconceivable then that even the birds should speak such wisdom. You begin to see the whole world differently. So the last verse. Dattatreya continued his teaching to Parshurama. Therefore, satsang, the company of sages, is the first step in attaining the highest goal. One who aspires to attain the ultimate should seek the company of saints. So this wonderful story, which has been covered over the last few chapters, the story of Himalekha and Himachuda is basically to illustrate the point that Dattatreya makes to Parshurama. He says it is satsang which is the first step to attaining the goal. Keeping the company of sages, keeping the company of teachers. Sat is truth, ang, sang is gathering. Now while this is absolutely true, keeping the company of sages, saints. We can expand this, broaden this concept to say keeping good company. And as I have often said, if you keep the company of thieves, sooner or later the police is going to come knocking at your door. Even though you may not have stolen anything, you will be incriminated. You will be involved there because of the company you keep. So keep good company to start with. Keep the company of people that have similar interests. If you have these interests, then develop a circle of people around or attend such meetings and be a part of such company so that this is strengthened in you. Very often this is happening in our modern societies that such groups are coming together but very often these groups are degenerating into basically socialization. Social events and social gathering around food and uh, uh, you know uh, social events, cultural events. While I'm not against any of these, we saw that Himale Chuda was gathering wealth, amassing wealth, and conquering enemies. It's, it is fine to do that, but it's always important to have a very strong, focused company. I see these meetings also in a way 
as providing satsang to many of you who may not find such gatherings in your immediate surroundings. Thus ends chapter 10, the analysis and knowledge of Atman. Chapter 11, the nature of the universe is explained. Having completed the story now, we come back, of course, to the conversation between Dattatraya and Parshurama. We are always going back and forth between the conversations between Dattatraya and Parshurama and the stories that Dattatraya narrates. So the narration is over and we are back to the conversation again, the dialogue. After listening to the wonderful story of Hemalekha, Parshurama still had some doubts and continued asking, Gurudev, the wonderf wondrous knowledge that you have imparted is amazing. It is difficult, almost impossible to comprehend. How can this external world be just consciousness? I do not perceive it that way. I can accept your claim on faith but not through any other means. I cannot experience consciousness without an object. It is not logical. How can I assimilate this? Kindly explain this to me. So, this is a very good question because I feel this question is these wonderful sages who, who wrote these kind of texts, they always use these questions exactly the kind of questions that are asked by all of us, the layperson. And so it's a wonderful question. He says, I don't understand what this is. How can you say everything is consciousness? And I, can, I cannot ex, ex, you know, accept this claim. He says it's a claim, which means there is still a lack of faith he can accept it on, on faith as in, okay, you say it, you're a great sage, I believe you, but I don't know it. I have not experienced this. It doesn't even sound logical. So, what is the problem here? It's his lack of experience. Remember, he was practicing at Mount Mahendra for 12 years. Now, I remember that time Shibu said, oh, he was practicing for 12 years and he didn't attain. And yes, it's possible if you are having external practices that even after 12 years you have not attained. So, what has happened is that he has been here at the external level, at the level of the senses, at the level of the body, maybe at the level of the breath. He may have got to know himself with a conscious mind a little bit, but he has not understood the deeper aspect of the unconscious mind and primarily the center of consciousness. He has not had that experience. Once you have had this experience of being in the center of consciousness, a natural byproduct of that is that you begin to see the rest of the world as consciousness as well. You remember, just a few pages back, the text said, do not contemplate on this, do not parrot this, do not use it as a mantra, don't keep saying everything is consciousness. Focus on meditation, attain and when you attain, you will realize this is all consciousness. So from this question of Parshurama, it is very clear. He has admitted it. He says it. I do not know this through direct experience. This claim I can accept on faith. That is, he trusts Dattatreya. He has faith in him. I, so he says, I accept it in good faith. If you say so, it must be true. 
but I do not know it. So he says, how can I simulate this? So the Tatraya replies, O Parshurama, I will reveal the secret of the existence of the external world. This entire universe exists only in the eyes of the perceiver. It has an existence of its own. Now if you just stop for a moment and think about this, this is a very bold statement, a very bold claim in inverted commas. <laughs> saying this world does not exist, this universe does not exist, it's only perception, it's an illusion. I will tell you the way. Listen carefully. These objects are said to be effects, having a cause behind them. Anything that appears in a new form is called birth. The universe changes its forms, form all the time. That's why it is, always looks totally different. Another very interesting statement in this verse, it says anything that appears in a new form is birth. So when you're reborn in a new form, that's why it's called birth. And similarly, when you go through very, very powerful meditative experience, a radical transformation takes place in which people, your, your physical form may not change, but your mental form has changed, your personality has changed. And so that is also birth, rebirth. It's a different kind of rebirth. And so we, we, we say that's the second birth, which that happens in a lifetime. We call such people twice born. There is a tradition. Do you all know which tradition I'm talking about? It's there in the Christian religion. It's there in the Hindu Sanatana Dharma. It's in all traditions of the world that children when they are initiated into a certain religion, it's like a birth for them. And that plague takes place normally around the age of eight or nine. So what is that called in Christian religion or in Hindu or any other religion? It's there in almost all religions. Baptism says Nuta in Christianity and in the Hindu tradition. Here's confirmation. The, um, in the Hindu tradition, for example, the Brahmins, they have their thread ceremony. Thread ceremony, exactly, Manisha. So, Janai, yes, that's what it's called in India. So that's when you are actually symbolically acquiring a new birth. That's what in, why in the Christian religion, for example, there's water involved, a communion, as Perry says, yes. And this is a sign of a rebirth, the second birth. And that is a symbol of what actually is happening during meditation. And during meditation, there is a real kind of rebirth taking place because the old ego or ahankara, which is making made up of fixed habit patterns, is shattered, is destroyed through meditation. And when that, that is destroyed, something new surfaces. It's a whole new person born, and that is communion, that is baptism, that is genuine, that is new birth. 
Symbolically, we say that's why, um, for example, uh, Sumit comes from Calcutta. There is a great festival coming up now also. Survi comes from Nepal and most parts of India it's celebrated. Very soon, the Durga Puja, exactly. It's the Kali, the goddess Kali. She's the destroyer. What is she destroying? She's not a fierce goddess who's just randomly destroying we are not worshipping some sort of evil. It's exactly like Suri writes there. It's a destruction of Ahankara. These fixed habit patterns, mental patterns that we have, these fixed thinking patterns, this is what keeps us stuck and prevents us from seeing things in a new, fresh way. That's why we say as we get older, we tend to get stuck, we are no longer flexible. And we talk about a generation gap with our children, with young, young people. We don't understand how they think and feel because you have got stuck in these habit patterns, mental patterns, emotional patterns over the years and you are not able to get out of it. Through meditation, this is shattered. It's... An amazing experience, it's like death. It's destruction. That's why Kali is worshipped. She's that goddess which shatters your illusions, your perceptions. Or Shiva in his destructive form. when he dances the stance of destruction called the Tanda. It's a symbol. And then there is a rebirth. Because now you... Start looking at the world around you in a very different way, completely new perception, completely new way of looking at things. You begin to see things as they are. You do not just react out of habits. You respond to every different situation in a unique manner. And that is rebirth. And so all the religions of the world perform this ceremony as a symbol it's a symbolic reenact, you know, they're reenacting that what is desired, what is considered so auspicious, that auspicious moment when the ego or these habit patterns are destroyed. And that's why throughout India, but especially in Calcutta, they worship Kali, the goddess of destruction. Uh, she is the first Mahavidya. There are ten wisdom goddesses, and she is the first. And that is why she is the first, because it's only when the destruction of these habit patterns start that the real, <laughs> real practice starts. Real sadhana starts. So everything before that is preparation. It's the foundation. And it's when that ego shatters, you get a glimpse of pure consciousness. And then you say, aha, uh -huh, now I have to start. Now I have to mature. I, I, I do this systematically, mature, and then become firm in my practice and be established in pure consciousness. So that is rebirth okay probably a good place to stop if there are any comments or questions then i can take them now else we can stop here okay then bye bye everybody shivu perry manisha so read bye-bye, everyone.